rationality and tolerant biases are probably the main reason that people buy things they don't need and make poor decisions and in general believe things that aren't true. So it's, it's important to know about them. So a couple decades ago, scientists noticed this big disconnect between how theory said people ought to behave and how people actually behaved. And uh, this, this was very frightening to a couple of scientists, and after a couple more experiments, they figured out that uh, actually humans behave pretty much nothing like how an ideal rational agent would behave. Uh, our brains are prone to make certain types of mistakes really, really consistently. And, well, obviously this is a problem. So here's an example, right? Let's say I take two groups of people, and I ask one group, what are the odds of some famous tennis player losing the first set, but winning the match? And I ask the other group, what are the odds of the same tennis player only losing the first set? He could win, he could lose, either way. Uh, reasonably, you would think that the odds of a more specific event occurring would be less likely, right? Because obviously, to, to lose the first set and win the match, you have to lose the first set first, right? So you would think that the group that was asked the probability of the more specific event would say that it is less likely. In fact, that is not what happens. The opposite happens. In general, people think that more complicated things are more likely to happen. So that's odd. But that is not the only cognitive bias that humans face. <coughs> so here's another. I'm just throwing them out there. Um, so let's say I have a big wheel of fortune, okay, numbered 1 to 100, and I spin it and I ask you a question with some numerical answer. Uh, say, what is the fraction or percentage of countries in the United Nations that are in Africa? This is a real experiment. So I roll it and ask you the question, uh, do you think that the number on the wheel of fortune would impact your answer? That's, that's pretty ridiculous. But, again, this was a real experiment, and people who saw a 10 rolled on the Wheel of Fortune, their median answer was 25%. People who saw a 65 on the Wheel of Fortune had a median answer of 45%. 25% to 45%? That's almost double. So just seeing a random number, which has no correlation with the true value, seems to give people a starting estimate, a baseline, that they then adjust from. And they adjust up or down, but often they don't adjust far enough, and they get the wrong answer. So, I mean, clearly, this is pretty big. And, um, but what, like, why, why do these happen, right? Why are we biased? Why do these uh, consistent glitches in our thinking happen? So, you, you can sort of blame this on evolution, and constant optimization, but in general, if there's a really long, arduous, tedious way to do a task, and a very quick way to do the same task, which is maybe not always right, but usually right enough, and it doesn't fail too often, and again, super quick, then typically the brain will opt to go for the quicker solution, right? You need to be able to recognize a panther jumping at you instantly, right? So, the problem is, that even if these shortcuts are really, really good in general, sometimes they fail. And they fail in consistent situations, and these failures are what, can, uh, what cause a lot of cognitive biases. But again, uh, sometimes uh, these rules of thumb, right, these, they're called heuristics, these shortcuts, they make sense to use, right? Like if um, someone gives you a starting estimate for the Wheel of Fortune, if someone gives you a starting estimate for some value and asks you to estimate the real value, you know, it's going to be, your answer is probably going to be close to their estimate. They've probably put some thought into it. And if it's not, and they're wrong, and you answer something close to their estimate, and you're wrong as well, then you're both wrong, so you have an excuse. <laughs> Similarly, for the tennis player, if someone can tell you a lot of details about an event, that, it doesn't always mean that the event happened, but it certainly makes it more convincing. 
So somehow our brain then takes the shortcut that more details means more likely. And so we end up with these weird situations where people think that significantly more uh, specific events that in reality will probably never happen, happen more often than more general events. This is how people sell insurance. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, clearly this is a big issue, but it's, it's actually not just a big issue, it's a massive issue, and it's worth amping up because not only do individuals uh, make, well, make important decisions and uh, they are affected by these biases when they make those decisions, but, uh, you know, so do, so do important people. So do people making decisions that will impact potentially millions and billions of people's well-being. And it's really important that we have accurate estimates and we uh, of you know returns and risk and potential losses when we start getting to large numbers and when decisions start really impacting lots of people. Okay, so how can you actually like fix this, right? Well, I mean, you can look up the full list of uh, cognitive biases. There's a great one on Wikipedia. Um, it is over a hundred entries long. It is staggering how many glitches are uh, hiding in some low level of your brain. And what uh, I have to say, you might think that because I've told you about these, you're not going to make the mistakes anymore. That is completely wrong. <laughs> because this, again, was a real experiment for the, um, the anchoring effect with the Wheel of Fortune and for the conjunction fallacy with the tennis player, researchers went back and used the same test subject again and told them the mistake they made and the test subjects went, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I won't make that mistake again. Sure, I'd be happy to do another experiment. They do another experiment and they make the same mistake and they don't realize they're doing it. They think they covered for it. So overconfidence is a real uh, potential risk in this thing. But, if you actually want to fix these cognitive biases, the, the most important thing is being able to recognize types of situations where you're likely to make them, and especially the types of decisions where they start to play a big part. So, specifically those decisions typically involve risk and uncertainty and a bit of money on the line, uh, and tend to be pretty complicated, right? So your brain wants to use the shortcut. And again, as you get to really, really complicated situations, the shortcuts tend to become less and less accurate. So I can actually teach you about uh, one cognitive bias and how to alleviate most of it. Most of it. Um, it's called status quo bias. Uh, it's why people don't like change. So it explains, sort of. So, uh, if you are comparing two options, and one of them you already have, and one of them, you know, is a conditional. So maybe you're thinking about moving to a new city, or a new house, or a new job, uh, just a, a new, I don't know, PhD program, just something that you have, and then you're comparing something against it. The, uh, the thing that you currently have is always at an advantage because I guess it's, it's tried and tested. Again, it makes sense that the rule of thumb, if you already have it and it works, don't get something new. In general, that can make sense. But in specific cases, this, this irrational fear of change can cause people to miss opportunities that could potentially improve their lives for the better. So here's how you fix it. Uh, let's say, as an example, you're offered some pay raise right, for a new job, but you have to move uh, out of your city, away from your friends, maybe away from your family. It's a tough decision, right? Maybe it's a lot of money. Um, but that's a tough decision. And I'm not going to tell you, you know, what's the right decision, because that's for you to decide what you value, but status quo bias might be impacting whether you're willing to switch. And here's how you detect if it is. You think about making the same decision, but in reverse. So imagine you're already at that other job. Would you want to switch back? Would you want to lose that pay, right? Take that pay as a decrease 
but for the benefit of moving back with your family and your friends and hometown, whatever. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't, but the point is, if you are not willing to switch one way and you're not willing to switch the other way, that's usually a sign that you have to put a little bit more thought into that particular decision before you go forward. Okay, so you know how to fix one. But again, there are hundreds of these. Um, a lot of them are very difficult to fix. Only recently has there been a large trend of uh, researchers actually trying to figure out how to fix them rather than just getting a list of hundreds of them, which just are there and we have to work with. Um, and there's a big, I guess, cultural movement and there's some nonprofits and uh, popping up based around teaching people how to fix uh, more complicated cognitive biases and make better decisions in general. So, I mean, I think that's pretty interesting. And I think that it's worth it for everyone to look, uh, do a bit of research into cognitive biases and figure out the, the ones that can commonly affect 